Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your good word here in Ephesians, in Genesis 2, and we pray that you would continue to speak to us through it. Uh, we thank you for your good purposes in marriage, and Father, we thank you for its fulfillment in Christ and the church. Please teach us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you remember the, the past few week, weeks, Mickey compared Genesis 1 to like a map of the Tube Railway Network in London. And then last week I said Genesis 2 is like we're at a train station and it's being built on the network and, and someone sat down with an easel and they're painting a picture of what's going on at this particular train station. And we're continuing to paint that picture in Genesis 2 this week. We've seen the past few weeks that God has powerfully created everything that exists. He's done it beautifully, majestically, majestically, lovingly. He's done it all by the power of his word. And you could summarize the mission that God gave humanity as to fill the world with the children of God. And so we're on the edge of our seats here at Genesis 2, wondering how is this going to happen? And in this part of Genesis, we see that God's plan for doing humanity's mission is the beautiful creation of woman and of marriage. Our first heading is man's big problem, and we're looking at verses 18 to 20. So look at verse 18. Make sure you've got your Bibles open there, Genesis chapter 2, page 2, and we're looking at verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Now, this is surprising. Up until now, in Genesis, everything has been good. Now, something is not good because someone is missing. The man is alone. And many have thought that this means that the man is lonely, you know, like he, he might put his dating profile up online. Lonely, looking for love, handsome young man, very young. His name's Adam. Great prospects, huge property portfolio looking for a girl to pass the time with. But if we're reading the text closely, this isn't quite right, because even though human companionship is critical, Adam already has great fellowship with God. And so the problem wasn't loneliness for Adam, the problem was incompetence. If the mission is to fill the earth with God's children, well, Adam can't very well do that on his own. If you look at the end of verse 18, God resolves to fix the situation. He says, I'll make a helper fit for him. And we need to be clear that the helper is not, that the term helper is not a negative term in the Bible. In fact, the most common use of the word in the Bible is as a name for God. And so in Psalm 33 20, it says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And so this is wonderful. God is going to create a helper for Adam to join his mission. And she's described as a helper fit for the man. And this word, Fit, it's actually two Hebrew words, which mean like and opposite. And so somehow she is like Adam, and yet somehow she is opposite. I think that's a perfect description. Men and women are alike in that we're all created in God's image, and Peter will later say that we're all heirs of eternal life through Christ. And yet men and women are also opposite or complementary to each other, both in terms of of sex and the way they naturally fit together and can produce children they're fit but also in the way they bring difference to the relationship to shape and help each other in the common mission they share together man and woman equal but different and it's a beautiful difference that has been purposefully created by god for our good so it's a dream situation we have here really god wants a helper for the man who is perfectly suited and in verses 19 to 20, God and Adam go searching. So read verse 19 with me. It says, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. It's like a big zoo parade. You know, you can imagine these big gray beasts walking past Adam, and he says, let's call those elephants. And he turns to God and he kind of shakes his head and says, no, they're not, going to be, they're not going to be a fit helper. And a couple of tall yellow and brown animals mosey past and Adam says, how about giraffe? 
But he shakes his hand, head at God again and says, no, they're not going to be fit helpers either. Naming them shows God, uh, Adam's authority over the animals here. It's also the beginning of the natural sciences, which is wonderful. Adam categorizes these animals. It, it's called taxonomy. And if you stop and think about it, every single natural science is just a version of taxonomy, assigning labels and showing how they relate to one another. And this is amazing. God's created the man in such a way that he can go out and discover the world and have dominion over it. Albert Einstein said the most incomprehensible fact about the universe is that it is comprehensible. But he didn't account for Genesis 2 here. He didn't account for the fact that God created us in such a way that we can understand the world. Genesis 2 is why science works. What a wonderful gift. And then the point after naming all the animals, is in verse 20. Read it with me. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So we've looked at man's big problem and we're still left hanging. And this leads to our second heading, which is God's incredible solution. In verse 21, we see God's moved from the potter last week and now he becomes the surgeon. Read it with me. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, like he's the first anaesthetist. And, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And verse 22, he fashioned the rib into a woman. And you could imagine Adam after the surgery waking up, maybe his side is feeling a bit sore. And as he's waking up, rubbing his eyes, he sees a procession coming towards him. God's walking Eve down the aisle. And Adam's seen some beautiful sights in the garden, but this one tops them all. He's completely blown away, and he breaks, into, breaks out into poetry in verse 23. At last, this is the one. And the phrase, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, doesn't just say that Eve is different to the animals and like Adam, although that is true. It's actually a phrase used in the Old Testament to indicate that someone is family. He's saying, she's my family, which is quite remarkable when you think about it. When a man and woman get married, they become a family, even though they're not related. And how good is that? As they go out and fill the world with children of God, those children are going to have two parents who are family. That's how close their bond is. That's the secure and comforting environment the children will be raised in, their own family. So we've had man's big problem and God's incredible solution. Our third heading for verses 24 and 25 is marriage in paradise. And these verses, again, they're a beautiful picture. God's good design for marriage is excellent. Look at verse 24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So there are three components to marriage here. There's leaving, holding fast, and one flesh. Leaving means there's, there's actually a separation that takes place in marriage, like a divorce. But it's a divorce or a separation from the original family. So in ancient Israel, it's quite common for the wife to leave her family and they'd go and live nearby the husband's family. But this is very clear. There's to be a separation from the man's family too. That's how close the bonds of this new family are going to be. Bonds to the old families are suddenly released. And so even though the husband and wife are still to honour their parents, they need to be clear that their primary commitment now is to each other and not their parents. And leaving is public. Everyone in the community is aware that the man and woman have gone out from under their parents' own households and they've started a new one of their own. So there's the leaving. The second thing we see in verse 24 is holding fast or in the old language they'd call it cleaving like sticking to each other leaving and cleaving it's a covenant commitment to stick with each other no matter what and the wedding vows are beautiful here for richer for poorer for better for worse in sickness and in health as long as we both shall live and so leaving and cleaving and then at the end of verse 24 they become one flesh and this means union. It's a sexual union between man and woman. It's also an emotional and psychological union that comes in marriage. 
husband and wife are united. They're a new family. And this is then expressed, their union, in producing children. They're one flesh union. And then at the end of the passage, we have this beautiful statement, verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. They're naked physically, they're naked emotionally. They're completely united to each other without the barriers of sin and shame. It's it's a lovely, intimate picture of the first husband and wife. And I think it's actually worth stepping back for a moment and just reviewing it, looking at this picture that God's painted for us in Genesis 2 and seeing how great it is. God wonderfully creates the woman, remember. One commentator wrote that the situation is called not good until woman graces the globe. God created her perfectly fit to be a helper for the man. This lovely picture of working together in God's abundant and beautiful creation, filling the earth with more children of God. She brought, she's brought to Adam... He explodes in ecstatic praise through poetry. The relationship will be so close that they'll be family. What a great way to go about the work that God has given them. It establishes the pattern of marriage, leaving the old families so they can be completely committed to one another and cleave to one another, committed no matter what to serve God together. To go out into the world as one flesh, united in their cause. And sex, there's sex here. It's not an afterthought. It's not like God came across the man and woman one day and went, whoa, what are you doing? No, sex is here right in the garden. It's God's gift. He fully intended for them to be one flesh and to fill the earth. So you step back and you look at this picture and you think, wow, isn't this amazing? Wouldn't it be incredible if the earth were filled with families that operated like this? It's just beautiful. Now, I don't need to tell you that we're not in the garden anymore. And as we look at that picture, we can see how sad it is that we stumble and we turn away from God's good purposes. In some ways, it goes without saying that the Bible clashes with our culture's views of marriage. And this shouldn't surprise us. In every generation, the Bible will clash with the culture. It might clash on different topics than it did 200 years ago, but we're sinful people, and so we produce sinful cultures that will go against what God's good word says. It's to be expected. Our responsibility as Christians is to go with the Bible, even when it's hard, because we trust that God's good word is for our flourishing and that it fits with reality. So a few things to notice on how God's view of marriage and his purposes for marriage do clash with the culture. Uh, The first thing to notice is that this passage says yes to commitment and no to divorce. God's design for marriage is that it's for life. Verse 24, to hold fast to each other as one flesh for all of life. In Matthew 19, Jesus quotes Genesis 2 and says, no one should get divorced because they are no longer two, but one flesh. He says, what therefore God has joined together let not man separate. Now, I'm not saying there's no allowance for divorce in the Bible, but these allowances are because we live in a fallen world, a sinful world. And I know there are Christian people here who have been through the pain of divorce and I'm sure would stand with the Bible in recommending against it. The beautiful model of Genesis is that marriage is for life, And that is the ideal we should be aiming for in our marriages. The second thing to notice is that this passage says yes to committed lifelong marriage and no to cohabitation outside of marriage. So in recent years, I think it's pretty clear that the church has has been trying to uphold God's good view of marriage between a man and a woman. But perhaps we haven't been so clear on the disaster that is cohabitation outside of marriage. As I was coming of age, I I feel like that was the time when cohabitation was really taking off. Like, I've got a big extended family. I've got 14 sets of uncles and aunties. And all of them, I think all of them, if I go through them, I think all of them were married before they moved in together. But then if I look at my generation, or my cousins, more than 50 of them, I can't think of any who got married 
before living together. It's like a switch has happened. There's this, this great experiment that our culture has been playing with cohabitation. And they would have said when they were moving in together, we, we don't need a piece of paper to validate our relationship. You know, there's no harm being done here. But the results are in on this big experiment and they're devastating. So Patrick Parkinson released a paper recently that reports on couples with children and says if they live together before getting married, they are four, more, four times more likely to split up than a couple who got married and then started living together. And that goes up to seven times more likely to split up for a couple that never marries. It's tragic. And like is so often the case, you only see the damage once it's been done. It's the law of unintended consequences. But if we trusted Genesis 2, it wouldn't have happened. The third thing to notice is that this passage says yes to sex inside of marriage, and it says no to sex outside of marriage. So in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is quite shocked that members of the church would still be visiting prostitutes like the rest of their society did quite commonly. And he quotes Genesis 2 and he says, don't you know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two will become one flesh. See, sex is a very powerful thing. It unites two people. And that's why it's only meant after the husband and wife have left their families and come together, committed to each other, to hold fast. An illustration I've heard is that sex is like supergluing two pieces of paper together. It's not a perfect illustration, but when you do it, then it really just becomes one piece of paper. And if you try tearing them apart again, it's painful. See, people sometimes think God's holding something back by only reserving sex for marriage, but he's only holding back the pain produced by sex outside of marriage. It's a fascinating study that came up in one of John Anderson's recent podcast that he had with a sociology professor. He cited a study of British women that showed religious women who attend church with their husbands actually have more satisfying sex lives than their non-religious counterparts. Now, that's something we're not going to hear about or see in a movie, but it makes sense when you look at God's design for marriage that we see in Genesis 2. The fourth thing to notice is that this passage says yes to marriage between one man and one woman and no to any other combination. It's one man leaving his parents and being united to one woman. Not two men, not two women, not one man and two women, not two women, one woman and two men. God's good design is clear here. And it stands regardless of how governments might try to redefine it. So there's four ways that our culture goes against God's good purposes in Genesis 2. And it's, it's very sad to see so many precious human souls who follow the paths of our culture to destruction. But if we're honest with ourselves, it's not just the culture out there. It's actually us in here. Us in here, we, we've fallen short of this beautiful pattern that God set out for us in Genesis 2. And that's what the Ephesians 5 reading was there for. Because Paul looks at marriage, he says, it's a profound mystery, but it's actually talking of Christ and the church. It's an even greater marriage. What Jesus invites us into is so much, so much more wonderful than any human marriage, and it's open to everyone, no matter your marital status. Some of us carry heavy burdens of sin and shame when it comes to marriage and sex, but remember that Jesus came for sinners like us. He didn't come for people who think everything's fine, and he doesn't leave us in our sin. Actually, he doesn't even take us back to the garden. I can remember that idea of of Genesis 2 being a painting of a train station, maybe in, in London. Jesus doesn't just give us a good painting. He takes us to London. He gives us the deeper reality. What marriage was meant to point to 
in the first place. Not the marriage of Adam and Eve, but the marriage of Christ and the church. And it's so much richer and deeper than anything we could have imagined. In Jesus, you have the spouse who loves you and sticks to you despite your repeated unfaithfulness. You have the spouse who supports you and forgives you and guides you. The one who holds fast to you, even to the point of death. Who rescues you and raises you to eternal life. You know, I think of the heroes of the faith amongst us. Those who um, maybe have never married because maybe there was an opportunity to marry. But it was with someone who wasn't following the Lord themselves and so they said no. I think of those heroes amongst us who have decided to pursue a life following Jesus instead of a life following their same-sex attractions. And they are heroes. And the reason they're able to do it is because they look to a greater relationship. The relationship with Jesus that we have as members of the church. So much greater than any earthly, temporary marriage. So I want to encourage all of us to pursue that greater, deeper relationship with Christ. Whether you're married or single, divorced or widowed, or however you find yourself. The plan for the world to be filled with God's children in Genesis 2 is beautiful. But to see how it's been fulfilled in Jesus as he fills the world with children of God, as he brings them to himself, That is so much greater. That's the relationship that we're to pursue above all others. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have made us for yourself. And we thank you that through the Lord Jesus, we can be brought near. We can have that that marriage of which Genesis 2 is but pale picture father we do thank you for your purposes in marriage that you have revealed to us in genesis 2 we pray as a church community that we would honor marriage uh, that we would uh, seek to pursue marriage in the in the way you've given it to us but yes father we pray that we would pursue christ with even greater zeal and it's in his name we pray amen